So our first speaker is, is Julie. Uh, Julie, would you like to start by introducing yourself and then go ahead with a five minute presentation? I actually am just going to jump in. Um, I'm Maria Pretzelis and I'm working with Julie on this. Um, so um, I manage the DMP tool and work at the California Digital Library. Um, and in our quick lightning talk today, we're going to demonstrate a really cool integration that we've worked on between DMP tool and the electronic lab notebook R space. And this integration is really kind of notable because it's really kind of a proof of concept demonstrating um, how we can keep data management plans updated over time, which is really what we've been doing, trying to do with machine actionable DMPs. So with that, I'm excited to introduce Julie uh, Goldman, who's a research data services librarian with the Harvard Library. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Maria. Um, as Maria said, I'm Julie Goldman. Um, I'm a data services librarian at Harvard Library. Um, so as a data librarian, I partner with researchers to plan for the management of their data throughout the project lifecycle. And one important aspect uh, that I always emphasize is linking all of the research related outputs together, which is essential for you know, fair data and reproducible research. And at Harvard, we support the tools necessary for this. So DMP tool for compliant uh, data management planning, our space electronic lab notebook for consistent streamlined documentation, and Harvard Dataverse for uh, sustainable data sharing. Uh, so using these tools together allows researchers to follow a plan, easily document experiments, duplicate protocols, uh, share data, and retrieve data later on. Uh, so through our collaboration, as Maria said, we have created a video uh, to show how the research lifecycle is enhanced uh, by using these interoperable tools. So we can play the video now, Maria, thanks. Here is a quick overview of the DMP tool, R space integration, which facilitates linking together a data management plan and project outputs with minimal effort. Here I have my list of DMPs in DMP tool, and I am recording my research and storing the data in our space. I can easily set up the Dataverse and DMP tool integrations on the apps page, enabling our space to directly communicate with these services. I can then browse DMPs inside of our space. I can filter by my DMPs, and public DMPs, and can select which DMP to import. Importing into our space will store the DMP as a PDF inside of a separate DMP gallery, which I can easily view, as well as reference and link to within our space. Now, here is my research data for this project. I am ready to export my work. This is a straightforward process within our space, as I can directly export to an external repository such as Dataverse. I will make an HTML export and provide the information Dataverse requires, being sure to associate this export with the appropriate DMP. After the deposit is confirmed, I can view all of the research data in Dataverse. Most importantly, a direct link to the exported materials on Dataverse is then passed back to the original DMP in DMP tool as a unique and permanent related identifier, which supports traceability and fair data. This identifier is also recorded on the landing page for the DMP. This landing page serves as a public facing page listing all outputs related to this specific project. As additional data sets are published, these citations will be automatically added to the landing page, keeping the research materials 
and data management plan in sync throughout the research process. And that's what we've got. Um, I think we probably hit our time so we can save questions for the end. Thank you very much, Maria and Julie, just in time uh, for our attendees. If you have any questions for one of our speakers, uh, we will take, we'll have some time to take questions at the end of the session. Um, our, next, uh, our next speaker is uh, Kelsey. Would you like to start by introducing yourself and giving a talk at a presentation? Yes, thank you so much. Um, I am Kelsey Dufresne, and I'll be talking today with Micah Vandegrift, who will be starting us off. Hi, everyone. Yes, uh, Micah Vandegrift. Uh, Kelsey and I are uh, working the libraries at North Carolina State University. Uh, and the title of our talk you can see here is Communicated Scholarship and Experiential Knowledge Sharing Through Fermentology. Uh, so fermentology, we'll uh, give a couple of descriptions of this throughout, but it's um, a was conceptualized as a as a webinar series from our applied ecology department as a um, something to do during the pandemic to find a way to to share scholarship in a, in a community uh, invited and community engaged way. Um, what we when we got involved with the project, what we did was start to think about how do we um, change the how how can we adapt the format of that thing from a video lecture to something uh, made for the web in a way that uh, is um, is is readable and engageable in a in a way that a, a video webinar might not be. Um, you see in the in the title there that we're throwing on this term uh, communicated scholarship, which is a, an idea that we've been developing um, that we define. And you can see uh, highlighted in the bottom there as modulating, representing, and then amplifying academic knowledge in non-academic modes. We can talk more about that later if you'd like. And ultimately, we see this project and this collaboration, which we'll talk a little bit more about, as aligning with a lot of the Force 2021 pillars, including the future science work systemic change for equity inclusion, as well as science discoverability. So fermentology, again, the, the webinar series was uh, meant to be a, 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 a discovery of uh, the, the foods that we have around us, the foods and, and the cultures uh, and the uh, bacteria and the yeasts and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and the connection between the libraries and the applied ecology department came when um, our project partner, Rob Dunn, who's in uh, applied ecology, uh, came to the libraries. And, and the question that he was asking was mostly about the, the sustainability of the material of the webinar series. And the word that he used was repository. Uh, and of course, um, you know, uh, from a library perspective, that's a, an interesting question already, but I um, wanted to extend that uh, beyond just thinking of how do we capture and gather these things together. And so what we have done is uh, in a way, reverse engineered a, a semi-scholarly public scholarship publication type thing. And so what this looks like is that we have the original format and mode of delivery, which was recorded videos shared on YouTube, as you can see on the left here. And then on the right, we have this new enriched format and with a new enriched mode of delivery. And I just put the link for that in the chat and it's all housed on PubPub. And so the new format really fo focuses on multimodal enrichment with differentiated opportunities for learning and engagement. And a little bit more specifically about that, these mini lectures went from a traditional model of knowledge sharing, and now we're trying to expand that to a new, different reader-centered and public-centered mode of engagement. And this is all done through PubPub, which Michael will talk a little bit more about. The, the platform that we decided on was PubPub, which some of you all might be familiar with, a, a, a product of the MIT Knowledge Futures uh, Group. Um, what was appealing to us about PubPub is that uh, they, they center um, the, they, the, you know, they call, call this the, the platform a community publishing platform. So they're, they're, they're centering the community engagement of, uh, of these works as we put them online in, in open and um, in public ways. Uh, and also some of the um, 
qualities of the platform that are um, web first and web primary. So versioning was important to us, the uh, ability to embed rich media in a way that really makes sense. Um, and then the exportability. So as librarians engaged in this project, we're thinking about um, sustainability of the platform. If you know PubPub Pub dies tomorrow, we know we can get the data out and move it on, move the publications on to a different platform because of the um, exportability options built in. And since we are coming up on time, if you want to follow this QR code, this is where you can play and read and explore all the fermentable, fermenting things in the world. And so we strongly recommend just playing with it. And then on the next slide, you can see how we have started converting all the different um, talks on a big array of topics into all sorts of different rich talks. And so over time, we're going to keep adding more and more and trying to expand the different type of media that we incorporate as well. And we say this is just a starter. So we'd love to hear your feedback. And so thank you all so much. Um, if you have any questions, please let us know. Thank you very much, Kelsey and Micah. Uh, our next speaker is Sarah. How fun, that was very cool. Hi, I'm Sarah Lafia. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Michigan and I'm at ICPSR, which is a social sciences data archive here. And I'm going to share a poster. Um, Close this. So yeah, here's a an overview of our poster. I'll just walk you through it um, in a short amount of time. So um, again, I'm a postdoc on a project called MICA. We're um, I'm part of a larger team with the school research researchers from the School of Information, and um, we're looking at um, data use and uh, specifically the impact of data curation. Um, and curatorial actions on digital collections at ICPSR. And uh, this is a two-year NSF-funded project to look at the impacts that curatorial actions have on research data reuse. And so the poster that uh, I'm showing here um, is an approach to apply machine learning to help us detect informal data use in academic literature. And so what this is doing is essentially we have a bibliography at ICPSR of almost 100,000 publications which are related to our data sets. And that bibliography is manually curated right now because there's still so much variation in how authors refer to and cite ICPSR data sets in literature. And so the, the idea here is to um, develop a machine learning approach that can complement the human work that is being done and infer in either indirect or implicit references to data sets. And so to expand data detection, uh, we're developing a computational pipeline, which is shown in the diagram in the center, um, which is going to, which is helping us search for indirect references to uh, many of our data sets. We have over 10,000 publicly available data sets that we're looking for currently. And so um, this pipeline allows us to search different bibliometric databases for things like um, our data set study names, um, known aliases that authors use to refer to our data sets and uh, persistent identifiers like um, study handles or DOIs. And so what we're doing is um, we are getting all available full text for search results and then applying a set of algorithms to that full text. So we're looking for a number of things. Um, let me zoom in here so you can see better. So the idea here is to um, check at the sentence level for um, indicators or indicator keywords. So we've done some analysis of, um, of known citations to our data sets to find frequent terms that accompany our data, such as survey or study, sample, and things like this. So that's a, um, an indicator term. We also look for things like acronyms and other textual features. And um, we, we use those features to predict, predict how likely a sentence is to cite a data set. And then within that, we've trained a natural language processing pipeline, specifically a named entity recognition model. Sorry, it's a bit blurry, but you can see here, um, this is a PDF page on the left that we've parsed. And then on the right, you can see the gray um, spans are predictions of references to data sets. Um, and we've trained this model on about 2000 sentences from about 400 publications that are in our bibliography so that the model can see the variety in how people are talking about data sets, um, specifically ICPSR data. 
And you can see the model is doing a decent job in this example of picking up things like references to AINS, which is a longitudinal data set, um, the American National Election Survey, and uh, the 1860 census. So we're, we're tuning the model now, but it's, it is proving pretty helpful in terms of helping us do some of the heavy lifting that um, our bibliography staff are doing manually and complement that ongoing work. And just very quickly, I'll show you um, some of the other analysis we've done. We've, we were looking, for example, at the distribution of um, different sections where data references or data citations show up. And um, we, were, we were finding lots of references to our data sets, for example, in discussion sections of articles followed by introduction sections and abstracts. So we're looking at some of these um, textual features in greater depth now to see if we can use that context um, to, to help improve our model. So that's, that's all I have to share. Um, I have a little QR code to a uh, preprint here, and I'll also post a link to this poster in the chat. Thanks. Oh, thank you very much, Sarah. Our next speaker is Joanna. Hi, Osman, could you please clarify it? Because if it's about the poster, well, the Open Rivers Africa, it's Daniela. Thanks. Yeah, I think uh, if it's for the free review, uh, open, the Open Reviewers Africa poster? Yes. Yes, then it's me. Hi. Oh, yeah. Hi, Daniela. Uh, sorry. <laughs> No problem, it's a lot of us. So uh, thank you so much for uh, to all the organizers and uh, um, for in inviting us and uh, for organizing this great conference. Um, I'm putting in the chat a link to a mirror board that I'll be using to share uh, the poster, but I'm also gonna uh, share my screen. Um, the mirror board, oops, that's not what I wanted to share. Not, uh, there you go. Um, the, um, Miro board that you can um, uh, all come to where I am, uh, but you can also look at uh, through the screen, I'll be zooming in and out. Um, and uh, has also allows for interactivity afterwards if you wanna use post-it notes to ask questions and provide feedback or anything that you would like to constructively share with us. Uh, so my name is Daniela Saderi, and I am very honored to be here representing the work of many uh, people, um, including uh, Joe Averman from Africa Archive and Aurelia Munene from Ader Africa, who are uh, joining here uh, today. Um, so uh, this is um, a work that uh, the, these organizations are uh, partners um, that you can see here, uh, Train Center in Communication Africa, Ader Africa, Africa Archive, eLife and pre-review, which I represent here um, as a director and co-founder, have come together uh, to, um, uh, to, to co-create uh, a program for um, uh, training uh, researchers based uh, in the African continent into engaging in open peer, uh, peer review, uh, specifically peer review around preprints. And just to give a little bit of a background around this collaboration and how we came uh, to work together, I wanted to share that um, about a year ago, um, and we uh, kind of like came together like in some of these, these uh, spaces um, around open science and activities, and we found that there are there were a lot of overlaps in uh, uh, our goals and our um, uh, missions. And so we decided to just convene um, a, an impromptu workshop to just brainstorm and, and, and go through the resources that we each were developing for uh, our targeted audiences, mostly researchers and scholars in different regions of the world. Um, and from that workshop, we identified some goals that we wanted to together uh, kind of bring forward. Um, and we began our collaboration and the moment the life wasn't yet uh, involved um, in um, and hosted a series of uh, workshop where we uh, showcases how to collaborative review preprints, uh, which is a uh, part of also the missions that uh, pre-review has. And of course, Africa Archive is one of the main uh, preprint servers for um, African content. And we had uh, a, a huge turnout of uh, researchers from the African continent and researchers in, in, engage in African related research research uh, that came together and kind of from different fields and different backgrounds and, and reviewed uh, a preprint um, for this series of, of events. And with 600 and plus uh, people that sign up and, and then the engagement kept uh, going forward with a WhatsApp group. And so from all the enthusiasm and a subsequent roundtable that we had during peer review week, we just um, 
and decided to just try to to bring more uh, to uh, to this content and to this uh, kind of mission of engaging uh, African researchers, early career researchers in particular, into the review uh, of preprints. And uh, there is where eLife also came on board, and together we um, were able to get some funding from the Wellcome Trust to uh, the project that I'm going to tell you a little bit about. And so what we're aiming to do here is to develop a, um, a a, pre, a peer review workshop that has really the uh, the as primary goals the uh, uh, increasing engagement and participation in, in scholarly peer review of African uh, researchers and particularly contextualizing the, um, uh, the the openness and situation situational openness of what it means to publish and, and to um, participate in peer review um, and uh, providing also opportunities to uh, showcase contributions to peer review and build their profile as um, uh, 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 constructive and, and actionable peer reviewers in, in this growing community uh, but also provide safe spaces for reflection around issues of scholarly knowledge decolonization, um, academic environments, um, and also showcasing open scholarship tools that can be um, uh, helpful um, in this context. Um, so to to those goals, um, the the approach that we are we are taking is to um, come together with all we had like initial brainstorming session of all the resources that we already have because all of these organizations have been working towards training and mentorship opportunities. So we have a lot of content, and so we went through that, and and now from that all the origin the, the content we're building and creating something um, uh, specific for this workshop series, and then um, we will um, have all of this uh, content delivered uh, through. Uh, specific tools that we're selecting with the idea that we are not going to be delivering the training, but we're going to actually implement a trainer, train the trainer model by identifying uh, the first pioneers and African research reviewers um, that are going to be um, uh, working with us through the content, making sure that it can reflect what their specific research communities may uh, find uh, uh, engaging and kind of resonating, um, and then deliver this workshop to uh, to those communities with the idea that all the we would also provide a trainer guide with some tips and, and on, on you know how to deliver the workshop, but also this trainer guide would kind of grow with the trainers themselves, uh, who would be um, obviously uh, supported to to grow their own style of, of communication that works best for their communities, and, and so we hope that this is a good initial scalability model. Um, we have a little bit of funding just to see this, and uh, we are going to commit it to delivering all of the materials they cre create under CC BY and publishing it, and also um, committed to delivering in, in English, uh, French, as well as um, Arabic, which was the main uh, um, uh, kind of Pan African um, uh, language. And uh, obviously, there are many other great languages, and but this is what we committed to for this specific grant, and we're hoping that then it's going to be more uh, taken up by uh, other translations. Um, and then we're also uh, aiming to support an, an, an ongoing uh, in, uh, com commitment to open peer review uh, by offering um, onboarding um, re resources to some of the existing platform that includes uh, pre-review as an open print uh, platform, uh, as well as Society, Africa Archive, and other partner platforms that our partners have already commented. And PubPub is one of them, actually, who was mentioned just before. Um, and I just want to close by mentioning that uh, we have this, uh, the, the plan is to, uh, uh, we are in phase one right now, where we're still bringing together the content and, and, and delivering, not delivering, excuse me, but uh, putting together the resources for the workshop, as well as the trainer guide. Um, and then in the next phase, which is going to be in the first quarter of next year, we're going to recruit the trainers and um, begin that exchange of information and kind of uh, a training session for them. And then and the last two quarter in the second and third quarter of next year, we're planning to have actually those workshops delivered and then track and evaluate our impact. Um, you can find out more about uh, the different organizations in this Mino Miro board. There are links. Um, and uh, there is also, I think, uh, our posters of Zenodo. And I want to see if uh, I forgot something, um, if Joe or Aurelia want to pitch in, but I think I already went over time. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Daniela, and the entire working group for bringing this very interesting talk. Um, we'll move to our next speaker, Richard. Hi, everyone. I hope you can uh, see my screen. And so uh, my name is Richard Wynn. I'm the founder of ResCognito, which is a platform for open research 
recognition. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to give a presentation today. Um, as you know, uh, most of uh, the credentialing and recognition of researchers in the past has been done through publishing organized by scholarly societies uh, and organizations. Um, but with the transition to open research, uh, there's really a, a lot of pressure for change. Um, there's a demand for processes that are more transparent, open and democratic. Uh, there's a demand to support more content types and activities. Um, there's the possibility of more granular attribution uh, so that a broader spectrum of people uh, can be recognized for what they're doing. Uh, and we need to be uh, more agile than we were in the past. So ResCognito is one model for improved uh, organization and curation of recognition by scholarly societies. And rather than tell you about it, I think I'm just going to actually show you uh, what we're doing. So um, uh, Mohammed here uh, is part of uh, Force 11. And if we look at his profile uh, on Force 11, we see he has his ORCID ID. If I use that on the ResCognito platform, I can search for him or I can search for him by name. Uh, this is on our QA platform, our system is live, but I, I want to put some data in to, to show you here. So um, this is what we call his ledger, where I can see his publications and recognitions he's received in the past. So I'm going to begin uh, simply by recognizing him in my personal capacity as Richard Wynn. When I do that, uh, the system prompts me to validate my ORCID ID so that we know where the recognition is coming from. And I'm gonna recognize him for community engagement, say. And now what you'll see is that his ledger is updating and you can see that he's received a recognition from me, a uh, what for community engagement. And that links my ORCID ID to his ORCID ID. So that's individual or peer-to-peer -peer recognition but the real power of what we're trying to do is involve institutions in this process. So I'm going to pretend um, that Force 11 has an account on our system um, so as to be able to recognize him uh, in uh, that uh, capacity uh, of a, um, an administrator at uh, Force 11. So I'll just go back and find his record here. and pull it up. And now when I click on the recognize button, you'll see that I'm recognizing him on behalf of Force 11 rather than me personally. I have more options for what I recognize him for. And in this case, I'm gonna say that he is a, uh, a working group co-chair. I can put a reason in and I can put a link in to the, uh, to, to the working group um, if I had the link there. And then when I recognize him, in this case, instead of a personal recognition, we're seeing that he's been recognized by an organization uh, uh, identified by their raw ID. So now I'm gonna switch to our live system so that you can see what this looks like. This is Alice Meadows. Uh, this is her ORCID ID. This is recognition that she's received from various people. And if we visualize that, we can see a visual representation of individuals that have recognized her, but or also institutions, including the RDA. And it, uh, RDA, we have a small project with them where they have recognized a number of their members for a variety of reasons. You can see their members here with the recognitions they've received. And this can also be visualized in the form of a pie chart here where different RDA members have been recognized for webinar contributions, awards, committee work, et cetera. And I can narrow those choices down and look through them and drill down uh, into those records. All of this is available for free through an API. Uh, this is a JSON uh, showing the uh, recognitions that uh, um, Alice has received uh, uh, based on a, her ORCID ID. And then because this is an API, you can combine it uh, with uh, data from other sources. So this is a small example uh, that we put together combining the ResCognito API with Crossref, Unpaywall, and ORCID data. So now if I look at Alice's data, 
Uh, I can pull uh, information in from ORCID to see her previous employments. I can display over that the recognition that she's received, individual recognition and institutional recognition. I can see which publications she's made. Uh, using the unpaywall API, I can see which ones of those were open access and obviously drill through to them. And I can also, using the Crossref um, uh, system, uh, show the tweet counts uh, for each of those uh, activities. So that's a, a very, very quick uh, uh, presentation uh, of, uh, of what we're up to. Um, I would encourage you, uh, if you have uh, uh, and, uh, seen anything interesting here, please reach out to me. I'd be delighted to hear from you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, moving to our next speaker, Yuan. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Let me just share my screen. Cool. Hopefully, you can all see that. Um, hi, yeah, I'm I'm Yuan Adi. I'm from uh, Open Policy, and I work on something called Overton.io. And what I was going to talk about is uh, research influencing government policy. You know, how does it happen? Uh, we've been taking a look at it for the past couple of years now. Uh, the, there's more on the poster on Zenodo, um, but I'm going to cover some of it in these slides too now. So I mentioned Overton looks at government policy. Overton's a big database, basically. It's kind of like Google Scholar, I suppose, but for more grey literature, government policy, think tanks, NGOs, that kind of content. Um, our kind of main aim for it is to, to collect all these documents and make them searchable, first of all, so that you can, you know, find find them by keyword and organize them in different ways, but also to use them to extend the citation network. So the, you know, obviously we have uh, very well studied citation networks of journal articles, journal article and, you know, books and monographs and this kind of thing. We want to extend that into the gray literature and specifically into policy. And that's so we can answer questions like how much of the work from this particular group has influenced policy and been recognized by way of, of a citation uh, and potentially vice versa. So I don't want to talk about the product, I want to talk about what we've learned. Um, the first thing is that a lot of papers are cited in policy, it happens a lot. So if we look at Scopus, everything published and that's in Scopus between 2008 and 2016, 5.8% of those papers have been cited at least once in a policy document. Uh, our definition of policy includes think tanks and NG policy oriented NGOs, you know, reports from places like the World Health Organization. So it's not just national governments. It's also these kind of, uh, of organizations as well. The half-life of those citations is about three and a half years. So after three and a half years, you've got half of all the citations you're ever gonna get from policy as a very general rule. Um, I say it's very general. And of course, like all of the metrics, it's very age and subject dependent uh, in public policy. Uh, when you look at breakdown those Scopus articles uh, by subject area, Almost half of development studies articles appear in policy, but hardly any drama and theater, for example, as you might expect. So what things uh, have we learned beyond that? Well, the first is that knowledge brokers are very important. So actually it's quite rare. The closer you get to the actual legislation, the fewer citations of research you see. It's far more likely for things to go through an intermediary, a translational step. So somebody that's taking, the, whose job it is, is to take the research and then convert it into something more palatable uh, for policymakers that they're actually going to read. And that's where these kind of third sector organizations like NGOs and charities and think tanks sit on that interface between policy and research. Uh, it's sometimes a surprise, it was a surprise to me coming from academia that scholars are not the center of the policy universe when it comes to policy evidence. Uh, actually, the majority of references and policy documents aren't to journals and to monographs at all. Uh, there are things like blog posts and news stories and other policy, other bits of the grey literature. Um, so it's not unusual for a policy document to cite, for example, a blog post about a piece of research rather than the actual research itself. Uh, this is a really good example of that. LSE blogs, uh, many of you will know things like Impact and Social Sciences blog there. Um, obviously, policy sources cite a lot of economics research from LSE. It turns out they also cite a lot of LSE blogs and not always necessarily the underlying paper. Quite often it's just linking to the piece that the authors have written and then blogged about and that's what's been cited in uh, you know the, the government green paper or the, the the agency technical report going beyond uh 
simple citations so uh, the model makes sense for better or worse but it's what we use you know we talk about papers being the discrete units of progress and uh, uh, in research again not saying that's a, a good thing but it's how it is policy is definitely not like that. the way that academics interact with policy is not kind of a, a one-off you write the work it goes out there and people use it it's much more of a back and forth uh, or ongoing engagement and it's not necessarily to do with your output but sometimes to do with you as a person so maybe you were uh, acknowledged in a paper or you were an expert witness in front of a committee or you served on a panel this kind of thing. So another thing we've experimented with at Overton is looking for people names in the text and then trying to figure out what their contribution was that way. I'm coming up to my time. Please do look at the poster and also feel free to explore for yourself. So Overton.io, it's free for academic research. So there's nothing stopping you uh, getting a login. Love to speak to you there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Yuan. Moving to our next speaker, Kingsley. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the presentation. And thank you for having me. Um, can we hear me clearly? Okay, let me just get the PowerPoint. Okay, um, briefly, the, um, the reason uh, for this presentation is the fragmentation in the uh, community of inquiry, communities of inquiry, in fact, the whole uh, discipline. So I don't think any discipline is completely exculpated from the fact that there's fragmentation in how and the manner that problems are being solved so uh, what led to this presentation is uh, the fact and conversations that uh, grew up in the academy related to the current stage of research. By the way, I'm from the University of St. Thomas in Minneapolis, in St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, where I teach in the doctoral program, uh, Morrison Family College of Health in the School of Social Work. Um, my research mainly focuses on violence prevent uh, prevention, and I um, specifically use advanced statistical methods in my uh, studies, I'm also uh, in the mental health field um, as well. So um, in the area of research and translation and actually impactful problem solving, we've been having issues, um, and I'll be using the area of health, mental health, in, in building the example for this um, small talk, which is a very small part of a huge project that's going on right now. So the, the first question is, why are the disciplines still fragmented? Why are the disciplines fragmented, given that we know that human problems are interrelated? and that each of the disciplines, including the um, natural sciences, social sciences, uh, pure and applied sciences, and so on and so forth, are geared towards solving mainly human problems or addressing questions that are important to human beings. But why have the disciplines continued to be fragmented and why um, uh, has the problems not been consolidated from the standpoint of solutions. And we are finding that a lot of the problem is not from the theoretical conception of the problems themselves or from the way that they are being approached. The main problem is the way that communication has happened between and amongst the disciplines. So fragmentations from the, the um, the conception of the university, for example, or the research or the humanities or school of thoughts, um, they all sprung from small areas and then widened up. And with more permutations and configurations, 
rather than coming together to solve problems, they have expanded and have continued to weave away from one another or each other. And so that the source of that problem we are finding is from communications within the disciplines and outside of the disciplines. And those conceptualizations from theoretical work and applied work that show that individuals are disciplined are more comfortable when they practice within their own domain and when they involve others in the problem solving process they still recognize them as the other or leftover rather than staying together to solve that entire problem so how has this be, be perpetrated and several opportunities have been lost in this area, including opportunities such as enhanced ways to address the cancer problem, enhanced ways to address the problem of violence, enhanced ways of addressing core human problems that are affecting everybody. Often, when you raise topics such as violence, people in the um, uh, applied sciences or natural sciences would say, oh, okay, those belong to those in the social sciences. They veer off immediately from that. And then they attribute that domain of human problem to a certain discipline. The question that I have for all of us is, are those disciplines enough to solve those problems? For example, are there not mathematical ways and other ways with the pure sciences to begin to look into these problems? That's one. So translative collaboration. Translative collaboration is calling for extra disciplinary engagement in the human problems, calling for us to take a relook at who is invited to the table when human problems are the focus. For example, there are just this from moving from the disciplines that are not welcome or cannot do anything about the problem to saying, what might we learn from this discipline in terms of how to address this problem? I would not have enough time to really give examples and everything, but I would give one example of how I am, I am addressing that challenge within what I do. In advising doctoral students in the College of Health, um, completing their dissertation work, in my teaching at that level, even though we're in the College of Health School of Social Work, I go to physics, for example, to borrow some theories and then tell them, relate them to the human problem. A particular problem that a social scientist would look at, I ask questions. How would a physicist look at this problem? How would a mathematician look at this problem? If it's not obvious, we begin to think about how they might look at this problem. And the hope and the goal of this is that ultimately in the future, the near future, that the disciplines will begin to converge and borrow, at least be open to these other disciplines on how they solve problems, and then incorporate those things and invite more people in, into um, the table. Shifting gears from that particular example um, is one that has to do with uh, the routine of publications and what gets published and what is used. Uh, in terms of translation, that is another area of fragmented communication that is happening and that's keeping problems to not be solved uh, timely. So how even with the emergence of the open science, it has not solved the problem of the individuals who are going to use that research or those who are going to implement the outcome of the research in addressing human problems to actually know what it is so as to use it or implement it nicely and accurately. I'm uh, sorry that I have to interrupt you, Kingsley. We're just out of time. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Kingsley. Uh, now moving to our last speaker, Jeanette, and then afterwards, we're gonna be taking a few questions. Uh, Jeanette, please. Hi, everyone. Hello. Uh, 
I'm Janet, I'm from Gaze, and I'm going to present the results of my PhD thesis. And I'd like to share with you this diagram, uh, which is um, uh, the, the context of the presentation that explores some interdependencies among the relevant elements within um, research environment. And the idea here is to use the uh, actor network theory to demonstrate how um, research data has uh, agency or influence in science as scientists do. Um, so we have this research problem, uh, which is uh, a, like a dilemma. So we have uh, on one hand, an increase of data sharing requirements and data availability indeed. But on the other hand, we have lack of uh, researchers training and skills to reuse those data that are available. So uh, if there is available data, but the social scientists, in my case, I studied uh, this uh, public, uh, the social scientists, they know how to reuse the available data. And in this sense, I conducted um, an analysis and it was conducted on three layers. So what authors say, authors say researchers need to know is one layer. The other one is what researchers say they know or they don't or what challenges they face and what online training teaches. So uh, from this conceptual proposal, uh, as intended to raise uh, in the conceptual framework of research data literacy, the proposed requirements for data reuse, identify the perspectives and difficulties of researchers in reusing research data through secondary data analysis, and it, 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 at the same time identifying um, the es essential skills for data reuse in uh, online learning resources. And from this triangul triangulation analysis, I compare those characteristics of the conceptual frameworks with the perspectives of the researcher uh, and with the skills that were taught in online research, online uh, learning resources. Uh, if to do this, I reused some data sets from ICPSR and also um, many of uh, virtual learning environment and some resources that you might know. Uh, I conducted the analysis using uh, any vivo software, any vivo, otherwise it would not be possible to analyze so many uh, data. And the first outcome is a list of common requirements and they were compared with W3C best practices to evaluate the adherence of those practices. And uh, I came up with three main uh, requirements and skills. They are data access, data licensing, and use and use data collection. But what is uh, what is ex effectively behind those difficulties that were um, found among uh, scientists and so social scientists? So the first is assessing access data. So knowing the access rule, it takes too long to understand data access rules. Some of them are open access, some aren't. So the embargo period causes a lot, a lot of frustration to them. And the researchers, most of the time, they are um, afraid of infringing something because they do not understand those license types. So, so far we realize that technical skills and legal knowledge could be barriers to research uh, in our potential benefits for, for this new paradigm of uh, data reuse possibilities. And also researchers need to know how to transform those amount of columns and, row and rows into meaningful information. So this is uh, the, talk that, the talk that I had to you and I am here if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Jeanette, uh, our last speaker. We're now moving to questions. Um, for attendees, feel free to add your questions in a chat, QA section, or just raise your hand and I'll just unmute you. Um, we have a first question uh, for Kingsley. 
Uh, which strategy would you suggest to reconcile uh, the fragmentation issue you have you have ad identified? Uh, Kingsley, can you hear us? Hello. Yes. Can you ask that again, please? Uh, which strategy would you suggest to reconcile the fragmentation issue you have identified? Yes, that's a very important question, and that's really key to the to the. It's a model. It's a new model that uh, uh, we've created. Um, but the way to explain it would be to first of all to begin the process of having open mind. Um, in, in a university, I work from a university, so we are in the College of Health. We have several disciplines involved. So when I'm asking a question of a problem, be it violence, let's say, for example, why is this patient having a propensity to be engaged in violence compared to another patient? And I see somebody from a discipline, let's say mathematics, welcome to the table. I would not say no, because there is something that that person would contribute to this. But usually we've left those two areas of psychology, you know, nursing, medicine, and all of that. But our proposition, my proposition is that that is one of the problems with this. Begin to, in order to address that, we need to be open-minded and look for the non-sister disciplines and bring them involved. I've seen that really, really work hard. Recent, um, we, you know, I have had a conversation with a physicist, physics professor, who is looking into violence prevention with animals. And from there, there has been some ideas shared about collaborative work in the human realm and using several methods that ordinarily I would not have thought about. Um, so that's just one handy aspects of that model. Thank you very much, King Kingsley. Uh, the question you just answered was asked by Giordano Lapari. Uh, I'll move to the next question to Richard. Um, is there an intention to integrate the recognitions from your platform so that it shows in other platforms like ORCID? <clears throat> Yes, um, in fact, for uh, some types of recognition, such as the credit taxonomy, uh, we're able to push those recognitions back to people's ORCID records, um, assuming they give us permission uh, to do that. <clears throat> in general, the reason we have the API I showed you was that so other people can just come in and pull those recognitions in. Um, so our model is to make that information um, open and free so that it can be integrated into other platforms anyway. Um, but in the case of ORCID, we do have that push option because they have a destination place where you can actually put the uh, credit terms. Uh, credit is a taxonomy for recognizing contributions to a scholarly manuscript. It's a NISO uh, standard of about 14 uh, terms, structured terms. Thank you very much, Richard. We have uh, time for one more question. So if any of our speakers would like to ask uh, the other speaker a question, please feel free to raise your hand or just unmute yourself and ask. Is it like open question? Uh, if you do have a question to um, a specific other uh, uh, speaker, because you do have another question just arrived from the attendees as well. Would you like to take that? All right, so <laughs> here's another question for you, Kingsley. Um, just trying to read it out right now. Uh, can you see the question? Because my, my screen just freezed. I can read it. It says, uh, fragmentary yes, approaches have been a chronic disease ravaging data governance in Kenya. Is advocacy for a more multi multidisciplinary education justified as a suitable intervention? Oh, you're muted, Kingsley. 
Yes, just read it one more time. Okay, fragmentary approaches have been a chronic disease ravaging data governance in Kenya. Is advocacy for a more multidisciplinary education justified as a suitable intervention? Yes, from a philosophical standpoint, the question itself has the answer to it. The answer is yes. Um, so fragmentation, maybe it's a good thing for chemistry, <laughs> but um, fragmentation in terms of uh, disciplines uh, and human problem solving would always remain a problem uh, because what we miss is or are the diverse ideas that are extraordinary that the disciplines themselves cannot think about within their own quarantine zones. Each discipline has a floor and a ceiling and each discipline would always reach its ceilings. And that is where and when the disciplines that we don't suspect to be helpful would come in to solve the problems. Thank you very much, Kingsley. We do have uh, a few more questions, but unfortunately we are at the tip of the hour. So I would encourage you to slack our speakers with your questions uh, and keep the conversation alive. Uh, thank you very much to our wonderful speakers. Thank you very much to Nidhi, uh, Lisa and Emma for, for helping coordinate this session uh, and hope to see you at future sessions. Thank you very much.